They say Nigeria is too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. Why has the country stagnated on the path towards development? Listen to The Conduit on Vision FM 92.1 Abuja every Thursday at 9 a.m. as we explore issues around illicit financial flows in Nigeria, government's regulatory and policy frameworks, and offer practical recommendations to addressing the economic problem. The Conduit is powered by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from Trust to be rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. Why has the country stagnated on the path towards development? Listen to The Conduit on Vision FM 92.1 Abuja every Thursday at 9 a.m. as we explore issues around illicit financial flows in Nigeria, government's regulatory and policy frameworks, and offer practical recommendations to addressing the economic problem. The Conduit is powered by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from Trust Africa. Five minutes going down nine o'clock. Very beautiful morning to you and glad to have you on the program, The Country, this morning. In the international development community, the concept of illicit financial flows, IFFs, is emerging as a powerful and constructive umbrella to bring together previously disconnected issues. The term, I will say, emerged in the 1990s and was initially associated with capital flight that occurs when assets or money rapidly flows out of a country due to an event of economic consequence. These and more you will definitely get to find out on the country. But according to the high-level panel report on IFFs, Africa loses 50 billion US dollars yearly due to IFFs 
out of which West Africa accounts for 38 percent, 19 billion dollars for the total amount between 1970 to 2008. 30.5% of the $19 billion was illicitly flowed out of Nigeria within this period. And in this edition of the country today, we would be looking at illicit financial flows and its manifestations in Nigeria. This platform will be used to sensitize Nigeria on what IFFs mean and to generate public debate on the phenomenon. We have our guest in the studio today, Mr. Chine Dunwagu, who is the project director of Trust Africa here in Nigeria. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, we'll just hit the discussion. But before that, the program, The Country, is sponsored by the Center for Democracy and Development with support from Trust Africa. And today we will be discussing elixir financial flows and it, its manifestation in Nigeria. At the appropriate time, the phone lines will be open for you to call in and make your contributions. Okay, Mr. Chinedu, in a layman's word, what does an illicit financial flow connote? Um, simply put, like you rightly said in the introduction, it's basically unlawful capital flight. It is when wealth, resources, capital, uh, financial assets are moved from one country to another um, in an unlawful and illicit means. Uh, for it to happen, for there to be illicit financial flows, um, the resources must cross borders, you know, uh, so it must move from one country or one jurisdiction, or one financial jurisdiction sh to another. So that's as plain as it is. It is. Okay, you, know, you say it has to cross borders. How about um, within pockets within the country? Uh, that would count as corruption and bribery and not necessarily It's not to flow. the extent of illicit flows. No, for it to qualify as illicit flows, it must be, there must be a crossing of borders by the resources. Okay, how does IFFs affect developing countries and their scope? Um, bottom line, um, the factor of IFF, particularly for developing countries, is because most of the, the developing countries are what they call as originating or source countries so that's where the wealth uh, you know is generated but the wealth is not kept there uh, through some unlawful means you know um, the world finds itself to what is called destination countries which in most cases are the more developed uh, countries and so what it means is we are seeing you know the movement of wealth from places where it is generated and instead of being kept in those locations for development purposes it is moved to places where um, I mean the the landscape is better developed so what it does is it keeps the originating or the source countries poorer and then keeps the destination or developed countries richer to what extent is this justified there is uh, practically no justification for it. It's, it's theft. It's okay. uh, theft on a grand scale, on an international scale, um, b because it's illicit, because it is not done in a lawful way. I mean, it's differentiated from investment. You can go and invest in America in a lawful means, but where you are able to transfer resources or wealth or capital from Nigeria in a hidden manner, you know, outside of the boundaries of law and legality, then it becomes problematic. It then qualifies as illicit financial flow. So the idea basically deals with the movement of currency, the movement of wealth outside of the parameters of law, outside of lawful, useful engagement, you know, mostly to hide it in, in, you know, in financial secrecy jurisdictions. Okay, then for Nigeria, how will you say um, IFFs manifest? Um, IFF is like, um, using a layman term, the elder brother of corruption. Okay. So while corruption deals with mostly what happens within jurisdiction, within the national jurisdiction, uh, so say, for example, money is allocated for projects and it is misappropriated. So somebody finds themselves with $2 billion. They know keeping that money in Nigeria would raise flags. It would be very difficult to hide. So they find ways of moving that money to another jurisdiction um, in any of them more developed countries uh in w once that ha occurs you know then there is capital flight there is illicit financial flow you know yeah but if you for example 
raise money and you know start up a business that allows you to import and export and you pay your taxes and your duties even though capital is moving outside to allow you to bring in goods and services because you're doing it within the parameters of the law you are also enriching the economy in nigeria and that doesn't qualify as illicit you know but when you are moving capital in in the guy in in the form of disguising it and hiding it away, stashing it away in foreign jurisdictions, then you have entered the realm of... Okay, yeah, you, you said something to court. You actually said something about the export and import. What if I actually acquired it through the wrong means and I'm still taking it out there, investing it, or still exporting, importing, and all of that? You know, the challenge with it is the um, IFF and corruption are very much tied. So once, it, the, once the source is illicit, you can't then justify the, the, the end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so if you, for example, start doing business of $2 billion, you would raise flags as to the origin of the money. So while it might, while it might not have um, graduated to illicit financial flows because it hasn't left the borders, but it still falls within the bracket of corruption within the country. So there is a connect between them. Uh, the distinguishing factor is the boundary issue. So if it is still within the jurisdiction of a country, it's falls, into, it's falls into the realm of corruption. Once it crosses over, you have entered into the realms of illicit financial flows. Okay. With Africa still the continent hosting the largest share of people living with poverty and IFFs this important to the sustenance of the economy, is any effort being made by the government? Um, certainly. Um, when this government came into power, it identified three priority areas, security, economy, and uh, corruption. Um, ironically, they all fit into the IFF paradigm because um, if you do the maths on, on the figures you pointed out concerning IFF in Nigeria, yes. you find out that the bulk of it, about 60%, goes out from you know, criminal activities um, corporate criminal activities another um, sorry just corporate activities another 30 percent or 35 percent goes out through criminal activities while five percent is based on corruption uh, so once you are able to address security um, which is criminal yes and you're able to address the economy which addresses the corporate side and you're able to address corruption, corruption itself yes you are basically dealing with the sources the origins of IFF within the national space which is where it generates. So there are definitely efforts to address IFF. Nigeria is also engaged in the broader conversations at the international scale. We are members of the Egmont Group, uh, which allows countries to share financial intelligence and information. You know, so basically, you just don't know what is happening in your country, but you also know where your money is being moved to and you know what uses is being put to. That opens up the, the, the space for you to have conversations. Also, late last year, about July last year, um, the, the government had a convening um, on illicit financial flows at the State House, basically to discuss the role of illicit financial flows and strengthening uh, asset recovery and return in helping us meet our sustainable development goals. Yes, the SDGs. So, so th that conversation is ongoing at the national level and the Nigerian government is deeply involved in the process. Okay, to what extent will you actually say that um, the awareness of illicit financial flows has been helping with repatriation of funds? Definitely, it's, it's, it's working in our favor. Um, recently, we signed an agreement to return some, more of the, some of the monies looted by a previous military administration. So as the awareness is going, and it should also be put on record that Nigeria is one of the few, very few, if not the only African country that has successfully pushed for asset recovery and return. Um, so the growing knowledge of IFF is enabling us to track our resources that have been... Uh, you know, illicitly moved outside the country. And then it opens up the, the, the room for conversations with some of the uh, destination countries in terms of repatriation. It is still at its very developmental stages. It's not as advanced as it could be because there is still so much, you know, moving out of the continent and out of Nigeria. Um, but definitely the conversation is ongoing. There's a greater awareness. There's a, a, a greater level of interaction between international partners and development partners uh, in terms of helping stop uh, IFFs and helping return assets. Uh, I think sometimes the challenge is a question of nomenclature. 
It's how we describe it to the ordinary person. But then there are things within our space as a country that you know um, already address this these concerns. Uh, for example, um, Nigeria is working on what they call the beneficial ownership policy, which in cooperation with, in, in coordination with uh, the Corporate Affairs Co uh, Commission (CAC). Um, requires and is working towards the production of a public registry of beneficial ownership so people cannot hide wealth you know behind other people's names and behind companies and all of that so by making it open you're able to see who is generating the resources and who, where they are moving the resources and through the mediums through which they are moving, moving the resources. resources bvn for example also points puts a in check that yeah. puts a check the tsa Put such so those are just small measures, you know. But like I said, it's just a question of nomenclature because you don't call it IFM doesn't mean it doesn't. It does not mean it doesn't exist. Yes. Okay, it's still the country to ninety two point one Vision FM, and we have as resource person Mr. Chinedu Iwagu, Iwagu, who is the project director of Trust Africa here in Africa. And today we are discussing on the program illicit financial flows and its manifestation in Nigeria. Nigeria actually committed itself in London to open governance partnership and has since adopted co-creation approach towards its implementation. Do you think this has capacity to address IFFs? But first of all, I would like you to actually um, give us some an idea about this open governorship partnership. Yeah, you know the 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 open government. Uh, the open government Governance, partnership yes. yeah it's actually a very tremendous idea um, that basically implores governments to push towards transparency sometimes we not sometimes the, the the focus for a better part of our existence as a nation has been on accountability you know um, which sometimes can be reactionary um, the things would have happened before you start demanding for accountability what the OGP process basically says is government should be transparent it should keep its books open it should have information in the public space where it is accessible to people from budgets you know to procurement and the rest of them so whatever government does should be open for public scrutiny and that puts us on, on, on a very good pedestal towards transparency, towards accountability. What then that does is that it, bl it blocks off the leaks for corruption, which we know is a major issue within the Nigerian space. Um, a lot of the resources that have been moved out of this country illegally have been proceeds of corruption. And so the OGP platform basically is a very proactive stance towards ensuring that those leaks are effectively plugged. Okay, but to what extent has it been functional? Um, at the national level, um, there is good collaboration around it, hosted by the uh, Ministry of Justice. Um, it's, and it's also been scaled down to the states. Uh, quite a number of states have signed up to the platform, and a number of significant engagements are ongoing. Some states are better advanced than others, like Kaduna, for example, is very much in the forefront of, of these issues. Um, it also opens up the conversation around the application and the utility of the um, freedom of information law uh, so basically putting conversation on the table that we should be working towards institutionalizing processes that allow people to see firsthand uh, actually there's 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 what a phrase called the proactive disclosure where governments are actually told don't even wait for us to use the freedom of information you should be proactive in putting the information out there they have websites they have platforms where you should make those information available so there is ongoing conversation around that there's significant work that is going on around that there are some results already i mean it's not at the scale where we can completely say the system is open it has worked 100 percent but definitely there's been progress made on many fronts it's the country to 92.1 Vision FM and right here we'll take a break and once we come back, the phone line will be open for you to call in and make your contributions as we discuss illicit financial flows and its manifestations in Nigeria. Stay with us. They say Nigeria is too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. Why has the country stagnated on the path towards development? Listen to The Conduit on Vision FM 92.1 Abuja every Thursday at 9 a.m. 
as we explore issues around illicit financial flows in Nigeria, government's regulatory and policy frameworks, and offer practical recommendations to addressing the economic problem. The Conduit is powered by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from Trust Africa. And glad to have you back on The Conduit. A 92.1 Vision FM, today we are discussing illicit financial flows and its manifestation in Nigeria. With our resource person, Mr. Chinedu Mwagu, who is the project director of Trust Fund, Trust Africa, I beg your pardon, Trust Africa, yeah, in Nigeria. And the phone lines are open for you to call in and make your contribution and ask questions. The numbers are 080 91127. 352 You could also send an SMS to double three five three eight and be a part of today's conversation. Illicit financial flows and its manifestation in Nigeria. Okay, still on this um, open governance partnership. How receptive are people? We the people, how receptive are we to these and also to illicit financial flows? I think that's a major place of challenge, um, mobilizing the citizenry around those issues. I, I think it's a place where we need to do a lot more work. Um, like I said initially, it's a question of nomenclature. How do I explain illicit financial flows to the market woman uh, or the trader in Aba, you know? Uh, so it's a question of bringing down those concepts down to a level where it applies to the people and um, tying it around things, resources that are relevant to. But before I go on, let me just flag something. I think part of the challenge we're having in Nigeria is it's, it's a resource issue. Um, the fact that it, the wealth we boast of as a nation doesn't come directly uh, from the people in terms of taxes. Uh, but more it's indirect in terms of all your revenue and so the, that that occasions a level of detachment by the citizenry um, because if you were your tax that is being illicitly you know moved sure, out of the you country monitor you it. monitor it you'll be more pain but because it is all yours all your resources you know the ownership it's not there on a national scale as it could be if it were your monthly deductions for or deductions to the state from every income you have. I, th I think so. That's, that's also a, a, a link we need to establish in our conversations about these issues in Nigeria. But like I said, there's also a growing awareness. People are becoming more aware. People are becoming more reactive to these things. We're not just letting them slide. Um, last year, a number of issues came up and because of the public outcry, you got immediate government responses. And so we're making progress in that dimension. We're growing citizens' consciousness. And events and you know, activities like this help to f fuel that you know, um, sensitization and, and consciousness among citizens to know that these challenges are there, but then there are also practical steps to deal with it. And it's not an isolated case. The figures you gave represent Africa. It's just unfortunate that Nigeria scores very high in terms of its involvement in illicit financial flows. But the Open Government Partnership is definitely a very good tool, a very good platform to begin to push. And, and the good thing about it is it's called a partnership. It's not government-owned. Yes. It's a partnership between the government, civil society, private sector. So it's an all-inclusive enterprise that allows for people to step in and to begin to push government to be transparent and accountable. Okay, I just hope we Nigerians, we don't see it as the fact you said it doesn't directly concern me. We don't see it that way and actually um, get involved. But to what extent can we even get involved? Wow, you know, um, let me just answer that with the, I think the challenge we have is a question of impunity. And um, like one wise man once described it in local parlance, because also impunity you need to explain in the local parlance. He called it impunity. Mm -hmm. which is able for saying doing something wrong in the dark okay so it's the darkness factor that makes some of these things possible so as we begin to have conversations around it we push them into the light we push them into a space where citizens can see them citizens can interrogate them citizens can ask questions and as we ask questions of government and demand answers because they are not doing us a favor governance is not a philanthropy 
you chose to offer yourself for service to manage our commonwealth we then have a responsibility to ask you to account for how you have managed your so, so it's as we push this information to the public space we we reduce citizens apathy and we empower citizens knowledge empowers basically we empower citizens to make interrogations of their government about critical issues okay how do you think incessant conflict between the executive and the legislature will impact on interventions to address ifs without politicizing the issue conflict within different arms of government is bound to happen in one way or the other and i don't think that should be our primary concern our concern should be do we have enough policies do we have enough processes in place and uh, have we made enough investments into the in critical institutions to allow them to do what they are supposed to do regardless of what the sentiments shared amongst people in the executive or in the legislature the jury is still out there on that very question mm -hmm. but i would just give a, a, an example sometime last year um, nigeria was uh, suspended from the egmont group because we did not have an independent financial intelligence unit immediately the issue was taken up by the national assembly and the law was put in place to create an independent because it's a key requirement it's like football fifa saying nff must have a level of autonomy you know for nigeria to have a part so that's the same way it functions in the financial sector that our financial intelligence unit must have an autonomy you know to be able to because if if, if it has undue influence by the executive or by the legislature or any other branch of government it will not be able to share intelligence on whatever is happening around that space and so we we saw the arms of government quickly go into action to remedy that situation so that's basically what we should focus on the processes the institutions, their independence, and to make sure that there is a, there are enough policies in place, you know, regardless of whoever is occupying the office. If the policies are there, the processes are there, the institutions are working. We don't need to worry about uh, the, bad the conflict. Yes. Okay, but talking about policies right now being put in place, are there some kind of policies that you would say are not there right now to actually aid, um, will I say, a way out for this financial flows? Um, there are a lot of things happening, you know, the challenge again, it's a lot of it, it's not been finalized and a lot of it is not in the public space. For example, there is a bill in the National Assembly, the Proceeds of Crime Bill, you know, um, and, and some of these things would help, you know, address illicit financial flows. So, for example, if somebody uh, is, is caught with, you know, having stolen public funds, there is a mechanism for, re for redirecting that resource back into the budget and back into the economy of Nigeria. There are also quite a number of policies that uh, relevant government agencies like the Presidential Advisory Committee has come up with the judiciary. Uh, there's, a, there's a practice direction or non-conviction non based asset recovery. Basically what it means is we know it's been challenging to get high level, high profile Officials, yes. Yes, convicted for corruption. But then people have also thought, okay, while we wait for convictions to happen, can we at least recover the properties? You know, and so those are some of the things that have been put in place to ensure that we stop the gaps while we're also still dealing because we need to deal with the technical side of the issue. But we also need to be able to ensure that people do not just steal, get a slap on the wrist and then pay a pittance and escape with the bulk of the money. Mm -hmm. So there are processes being put in place to make sure that assets are recovered. Um, I mean, the figures being put out by the government runs into 500 billion in the last few years. And that's significant, you know, uh, uh, resources being recovered from, from um, corruption. Meaning this looted funds go to corruption and illicit financial flows. Yes. Like I said, it starts from corruption. Then and it then crosses the border. Once it crosses the border to a safe jurisdiction, whether it's uh, Dubai, Santon in South Africa, and it's not just—it's not just—it should also be flagged. It's, it's not just the West. It's a global. It's issue. a global issue. Even if it's moving within Africa, so if you if you're stealing the money and buying up properties in Johannesburg, it is illicit financial flow. If you're moving the money and you're supporting elections in Some any other African country, country whether it, yeah, it's illicit financial mm -hmm. flow. So long as the money is not moving out in a means prescribed by law. The law because if you're moving out two billion there are implications for the nigerian economy you know and then there are also rules that you should abide by but where you are moving that money out in any uh, unlawful means then you yeah, get your relations financial flows okay the numbers for you to still call and be part of the program are zero eight zero nine one one two seven three five two or zero eight zero two five 
1406-7. Illicit financial flows and its manifestations in Nigeria is our focus on the country this morning. You earlier said something about beneficial ownership. How can issues around beneficial ownership be effectively addressed? Um, it's as simple as the BVA. Um, everybody come and claim what you own. So it's basically like a public declaration of assets. You can't hide behind your children, your cousins, your aunties, late or uh, living or dead, and buy your properties in Abuja. So it's a question of saying, this company belongs to XYZ. So when you are quoting for contracts in government, and we go and look at who are the, on the board, who are, you know, who are directors in this company, and you are a government official. Quoting, so it basically pushes us into a transparent open space. So once the Corporate Affairs Commission is able to get that public registry fully functional, you know, people are able to then see, you know, um, it, it's not a secret anymore. You can't hide in buying up or hiding money. In space we can then trace assets to particular persons and when you begin to trace assets to somebody who should not be in the place for example to have that. yeah you're a clerk and then you are buying up properties in Asokuro we would be interested in knowing you know what kinds of investments you're making and why it's giving you that kind of return so it, it basically puts it, it's a question of transparency it's a question of openness and and I, it's also a, a key component of the open government partnership once we get that right like the BVA you can't have multiple accounts in different names we now have to tie your biometrics to it you have to own it so that if we type in your bva all your accounts will pop up yes and then we can ask you questions as to why you know um you your have the kinds of money yeah. of this. so it, it, it opens up the space for people to ask questions and like i said once you begin to ask questions impunity diminishes can the idea of safe haven that provide incentives for transfer of stolen assets and illicit financial flows abroad totally be eradicated from Nigeria? <laughs> wow, you heard of the Panama Papers, you yeah. heard of the Paradise Papers, okay. basically leaks on assets owned by people in um, what the, the safe heavens, places where the tax laws are a lot more f relaxed mm -hmm. than they are they're here. They're flexible. Yeah, yeah. they're flexible. Um, now, that is also, um, you cannot question the legitimacy or the, le the legality of safe heavens. They exist. What you question is how does your money get into a safe a heaven? Safe heaven. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's uh, you. We cannot make rules for other countries' tax codes. We can make rules for our own tax codes. So by reviewing our own tax laws and our own tax codes, we can reduce the possibility of you know people moving money to financial jurisdiction. So if you are, for example, going to one of the safe heavens, Panama, to invest. I don't know why two billion is popping into my head. Two billion, for example, we should ask you where you got two billion from in Nigeria and how much of that you have paid as, as tax. tax. Okay. Yes, and if you don't satisfy those questions, you shouldn't be able to move those kinds of monies. Other. So if we fix our own tax laws, if we fix our own tax code, while also maintaining, you know, like I said, the financial intelligence sharing with other jurisdictions, then it it would plug those leaks. So it may not be, it's a question of reduction. Elimination might be a bit more difficult. Okay, I even used a stronger word, eradication. You know, the it way you eradicate poverty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, talking about this tax thing, to what extent will you say tax, value asset, declaration, all of this? To what extent? I know it's like um, the, the strength on it has just been recent, but to what extent has it been successful? I mean, the, the figures are out there, the results are out there. You can see the kind of revenue generated by some of these institutions that nobody you know, was concerned about, whether it's JAM you're talking about, or the customs, or even the FIRS. If you look at the figures of amounts, um, you know, without necessarily patroni sounding patronizing to any government, but if you look at the amounts raised in more recent times where the searchlight has been thrown at them, you would see that we could do a lot more. I mean, it's not it's not near perfect. There's the uh, uh, the VATE, the Voluntary Assets uh, Declaration Initiative that has been launched, and I think it's closed now. Um, basically, that's part of the drive to ensure that Nigerians are more involved in this process. But like I said, the challenge is, you know, uh, uh, we are not pushing as hard as we can on taxation because that's not the primary source, source of, of revenue mm. for the country you know we are more dependent on oil 
So unless we begin to... But oil is already failing out. Uh, but we still budget based on barriers of oil you expect to sell uh, on a national scale. Mm -hmm. So unless you go into places like Lagos, where they have been able to push taxation to very, very successful places, I think that's a model we might want to look at and to see how we can scale up at the national level and also begin to reconcile taxation of the nation at the national level and at the state level, you know, because it would be unfair to tax citizens twice, you know. Um, but those are conversations we should say, and that's why we should have a very broad, inclusive conversation about the review of our tax codes and our tax laws. Okay, how can Nigeria develop a supportive, efficient, and speedy process for returning stolen assets back to originating countries? Um, I'm happy you asked that. There is on a, on a continental scale. Um, the African Union has declared uh, 2018 as its anti-corruption year, and our president Buhari is the champion for yes. that. So one of the conversations that's happening at that level is uh, a common position, a common African position on asset recovery and return, um, because there is none now. Um, when we want to go and ask for our monies back, we go as individual nations. Meanwhile, there are the high-level uh, panel has a report on how much has gone out of Africa, you know, to destination countries. So um, as soon as that, that, that policy is finished and put in place, Africa can then, you know, present a common front. Originating countries or source countries in Africa can then present a common front to make a demand for return of assets. Nigeria has recorded some successes. We, I think we have more than two cases of returned assets. The, there are also technical challenges around the capacity of the question of if we return this money will it be looted? Yes. Yeah, so those are also things you need to um, sort out internally because also countries need to be, I mean, th 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 there are two sides to the argument. If it's our money, it was stolen, it was found in your country, you shouldn't be telling us how to use our money. Just simply return it. You should actually be apologizing for receiving stolen properties. You know, but then people are saying if we return this money, it will still be related and brought back to our country in one way or the other. So it's a, it's a conversation that's still ongoing, but Nigeria has at least recorded some levels of success. But talking about this reluting and all of that, is there anything that is being done or can be done, or we have to wait for the finishing of this process? There are a lot being done within the country. Um, like we said, the TSA, um, the BVA, you know, um, those are some of the checks in, in country. Um, IFF and corruption are very, very closely knit. You must tie up the loose ends within country to prevent it from going out of country. You know, uh, so it's a question of having a government that is really willing to be open, to be transparent and strategic. You know, um, there are ideas that have been put in place and said, look, if the funds are recovered, you should invest them in critical places like education, like health, like security. These are places where people can see the returns, the dividend. The challenge is nobody, we're hearing 500 billion recovered and nobody's it's feeling, feeling it. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So until you put people in a space where they can feel it. And if you see the infogra infographics on some of these recovered funds, it is mind-boggling. One of the infographics says these funds can build 36 ultra-modern hospitals and in what is all happening? the states. But we don't have them. We don't have them. The, the government says it's investing the money in school feeding and all the rest of them. So the question is really, we need to be a bit more strategic. If you're recovering finances, also part of it goes into the national budget actually now. So, but we need to put, out, put it in a place because the optics count. Nigerians must be able to, to feel, feel and see yes, it. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we saw what we, what we did with PTF as also controversial as that was but they were tangibles you could see this were outcomes of this process so we should also be thinking in that regard do tangible things in critical sectors such as education and health with assets we were recovering how do we get to stem the flows of iff into and um, the illicit financial flows yes. how do we get to stem it address the causes address the root causes cue corruption in public office um stop oil theft yeah, because it's not just money. Where people are selling barrels of oil that are almost matching the numbers being sold by the state. So oil theft is also so stop oil theft. Um, push for you know more effectiveness. I mean, it's working, but it could be better in things like um, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative 
Nigeria has the Nigeria Extractive Industries Transportation Initiative, NATI, um, passed the PIB, petrol, um, the PIB bill. Yeah, the in the petroleum industry. industry. Yeah, passed the bill. So these are things that, you know, just help address critical spaces, you know, address insecurity. People are running away with their money because they can't invest it here. They are afraid. Supply power. Make the cost of doing business, the ease of doing business. Within the country. Within the country. Better, so that people don't are not forced to move resources outside. Okay. Okay. You're actually catching my attention with the fact that if it's invested in the country, but that's still corruption. The fact that it's stolen, invested in the country, not crossing the borders. If you if you if you do the maths, the 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 figures invested in countries it's minimal. Okay, just it's so far minimal. it's beneficial. Because it's hard to hide in country. Okay. Yes. But if we, even with that one, we shouldn't worry too much. If we sort out the beneficial ownership registry, it deals with local investments. We can see who owns what, you know, uh, and, and where the money is going to and or coming from. Okay. Permit me to ask who needs to take action in general. It, it's, it's, a cr it's an inclusive thing. Um, citizens need to show their anger more often. Nigerians are angry, but they don't show it. Uh, we say we're angry, but we, we need to show Are there it. platforms we can actually show our anger? Mm. Maybe other than riots and maybe some peaceful protest? Mm. Definitely. Definitely. Elections are around the corner. That's True. the most effective way to show anger. Um, you know, um, hold people accountable to promises they make um, during campaigns. Um, ask questions of the national government, but more importantly, the state government and the local government, if they exist, you know, yeah, those are ways of you know get getting people because the the government, as long as they feel there's a concept of anyhowness in Nigeria's government's political space where they feel if you can get away with stuff, you will keep doing it. But where the citizens are more engaging, where we know we would not sweep it under the carpet, do all the drama you like, we will keep discussing this issue. The government will retrace its steps. So it's 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 everybody. The government being willing to put itself in a position where it's accountable, but that won't come easy. Citizens would have to demand it and keep demanding it until it becomes a norm. Okay, meaning the government also needs to take action. Definitely, you're putting Every, the citizen yes. right now in uh, the yes. spot. Yes. No, well, I'm, I'm, it, it's a two-way thing. It's a two-way thing. Um, the government needs to be willing and capable because there could be willingness and no capacity but the government needs to be willing and capable of putting itself in a transparent and accountable position but where that is slow or not coming at all then citizens need to put the pressure so there should be there should be it's a with it's an internal and an external internal and external factors citizens do the external put the pressure on government and say look we cannot continue like this uh, if you do a budget we need to know where our money our money is going to we need to ask questions at the end of the year what have we done honest questions not propaganda you know not media hype honest questions we need to be able to trace assets we need to be able to trace investments you know and we need to be able to account for how we have used our sovereign uh, wealth all right thank you very much Wagu, for coming on the program today my pleasure thanks for having me Chinedun Wagu is the project director of Trust Africa here yeah, in Nigeria. And this has been the program The Conduit. It returns to you next week, Thursday, 9 a.m. This platform is used to sensitize Nigeria on what IFFs mean and to generate public debate on the phenomenon. As today, we have been discussing illicit financial flows and its manifestation in Nigeria. The conduit is sponsored by the Center for Democracy and Development with support from Trust Africa. My name is Omleha Ode. Do have the best of today. They say Nigeria is too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. Why has the country stagnated on the path towards development? Listen to The Conduit on Vision FM 92.1 Abuja every Thursday at 9 a.m. 
as we explore issues around illicit financial flows in Nigeria, government regulatory and policy frameworks, and offer practical recommendations to addressing the economic problem. The conduit is powered by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from Trust Africa.